what the Church of Scientology is so afraid of. This, this is SPTV. Uh, welcome back, everybody. I was just hit with some paranoia about my audio. Nope, looks like I've got my microphone selected. Praise Zenu. How's it going, Reese? Uh, good. Apparently, my quality of video is not the best. So I apologize if you guys, if it's blurry. Yeah, um, something happened between the videos you did yesterday and the videos you did today. Some sneaky body thetans got all up in your electronics, apparently, uh, because we cannot figure out why your video is uh, sort of pixelated. But you know what? I told her, I said, look, having bad video is not as bad as having bad audio. So as long as the audio is good to go, we're going to rock and roll. And um, we're just going to rock it, with it. Exactly. Um, okay. So let's see. I titled this, uh, I titled this video, Scientologists planning their own reincarnation. And I put little Tommy Cruz on the thumbnail because I remember back when Surrey was, you know, being born, going to be born, was just born. People were running rampant with speculation that David Miscavige and Tom Cruise believed that Surrey Cruz was the reincarnation of L. Ron Hubbard. And obviously, as a Scientologist at that time, I was still in Scientology. I was just couldn't have rolled my eyes any harder. And yet, and yet, when you and I were chatting and you mentioned some of the stuff that you're either your folks or your in-laws, I can't remember, I guess it's your, your father-in-law at the time, some of the stuff that he would say about your son and their past life relationships and his plan for future reincarnation. I was like, you know what? We should talk about this just so people kind of understand that this really is how a good number of Scientologists think. Yes. I mean, I, I would say more than a good number. Most, most of them. I mean, I, I, I think it's, I don't know, for in my neck of the woods, it was pretty common for people to talk about their future plan and where they were going to end up. And uh, just, just almost, I mean, it was like placing an order really. Um, they were just customizing everything, Aaron. It was pretty bizarre, but I didn't hear about the Tom Cruise and the Surrey thing. I never did hear that. That was, that's bizarre. I mean, you know, that's going to be the, th uh, it, it was probably mostly tabloid ish publications that yeah. were um, platforming that kind of speculation. But after we talk about what we're going to talk about today, it, you could still ask the question, why wouldn't they? Why, like, like uh, we've heard so many stories that David Miscavige and the people that worked at the international base expected L. Ron Hubbard to return after a certain number of years. They, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons they did some major renovation and building projects up at the international base. They rebuilt Hubbard's mansion. They laid out his clothes every day, all this kind of stuff. David Miscavige was getting actually really, really paranoid by all reports from those who were working with him at the time around the time that Elvin Hubbard was expected to return. He was getting really paranoid that certain things he was supposed to get done had not gotten done. And it was clear from these stories that Miscavige was a believer that Hubbard should be coming back. So why wouldn't he suspect that, you know, a big being like Tom Cruise giving birth yeah. um, to uh, would you pull know, in LRH, you know, not giving birth, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Would pull yeah. in LRH essentially. So, all right. Tell everyone what your ex-father-in-law said about him and your son. Guys, it's a lot. It's a lot. Everybody gather around. Every kid's leaving for this. She doesn't even want to be a part of this. She said I'm out. <laughs> um gather around everybody. Get huddle in. So Doug, everybody should know who that is. He's my my ex-father-in-law, Huxley, my son's grandfather, who's they're disconnected now because of me. Um, when, when I was pregnant, <laughs> I told them I, Doug and Brenda, I was pregnant and Doug said he had been waiting for this because his father, who I never met. Okay. This guy died in the seventies sometime. I was born in 84. So Doug's father has been no joke <laughs> sitting on a phone wire because there is no time. So he's been sitting on a phone wire, according to Doug, waiting, waiting for a child to be born. And so Doug believes that Huxley is his father. No way am I creeped out about that. That's normal, right? That's just another day at the office. So Huxley is Doug's father, okay? 
this isn't even the creepy part. We're not even there yet. Everybody stick around. So now Huxley's born and he's growing, you know, as, as we do. And Doug is just in love with Huxley. That's why really the story is so sad because Doug, as you know, just cut ties with them like that, like a switch. Doug is crazy about Huxley and he always has been. One day Doug tells me that he's decided his plan for, for his exit for when he expires. Doug says, I have decided when Huxley and his future wife have their first child, I'm going to drop my body. I'm going to get out of this car, hop into another. I'm going to be Huxley's first child. Uh, Aaron is speechless. When does this happen? I mean, uh, so the fact that adult grown Scientologists talk to each other about this is interesting and crazy in its own right. Um, and, and even when, when me and my wife were having our second daughter, Dan O'Connor, a Scientologist very well known to you, um, was in active discussions with my wife about recruiting an appropriate being to occupy the body of our second daughter. Extremely creepy. Um, but this kind of stuff gets sort of pushed onto the children themselves. So that, that okay. means that like, so one has to wonder whether Doug has ever said anything to Huxley about Huxley being Doug's reincarnated father. Do you have any reason to believe he's actually said this to him? As a matter of fact, I, I know he hasn't because Brenda has always been like, now, Doug, keep that quiet. That's obviously very, very evaluative. And she was like, I don't want to inv invalidate Doug's knowingness about him being his father. But we can't obviously share that evaluation on with Huxley because you can't talk about somebody's case and where they came from. So, no, none of that has been shared with Huxley. And I none of it ever will be shared with. I would never bring that up to Huxley. So um, that's nuts. I was talking about this yesterday on one of my lives and I was thinking one, that's awfully presumptuous, but two, I kind of made the point, like, why are you making plans for the, for your next, for your exit and in, in, into another life? Why are, why are we not focused on what we're doing now? Like I like, I don't love my body. I'm not like crazy about it. I, I wish my legs were longer, but here's the deal. Like, I want to be here. I love Mexican food. I was saying that. Like, I love, I love um, jewelry. I like to shop. Like, I like my current life. Why are you already planning for the next one? I just, I have too many dreams about trying different, different Mexican places and different parts of the country. I have a lot of goals there. And some Italian places too. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not just spicy, but I just feel like, why are we, what are you doing? I mean, what if, what if you're ugly? I said that too. What if you're born ugly? What if you just, what if, what if you meant to be a boy and you're a girl? My biggest fear is to be like super ugly. Like there's so many what ifs. There's a lot of loose ends there. And I just think, why wouldn't you just stick around now? And enjoy wouldn't it be funny? I, I, I can just see Doug. I can just see Doug when, you know, Huxley's, you know, has a girlfriend and Doug's inquiring whether it's serious or not. And then being Ew. like, well, no, no, no. She's she's way too ugly for me to pick up a body like you're going to have to do better. You're going to have to do better than that for me, bro. Like, do me a solid. Yes. Come on now. Yeah. Yeah. Her teeth are too so, crooked. I'm get, then I'm going to need braces. He's already like imagining mocking up his next body. I didn't even think yeah. of that part of it. It's creepy. It's weird. Well, so Doug could be going to Huxley. He's like, if not for yourself, man, do it for me. Think about me. I'm going to have to occupy that body. You can do better, Huxley. Yeah. Doug's like asking his future spouse, like, what, what kind of medical conditions do you have that will pass on to me? <laughs> Now, 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 I don't know Huxley's sense of humor or anything like that, but if he ever wanted to really, uh, I guess, stick it to Doug, he could run with this narrative and be like, Doug, I expected more from you as your father. I raised you better than this because Doug disconnected from Huxley. Huxley would be like, I didn't raise you to be, uh, you know, uh, just follow along with whatever 
you know, whatever some, you know, religious leader, cult leader tells you to do. I raised you better than this, Doug. Exactly. So weird. And, and I didn't, I mean, isn't it, it's even bizarre that like, I've known this for years. It, I didn't even bat an eye at it when Doug was like, oh, I recognize like he's got all these traits my father had. I just let that roll off. And he would say, I have my plan set. I'm going to be Huxley's first child. Like that went on for years that he would say that to us. And <laughs> I just, that's just how they are. It is, it is wild. And, you know, every now and then someone will ask, uh, you know, cause people will read things about this secretive international base out in Gilman hot Springs. And it sounds creepy and it sounds a lot like the people's temple ish kind of stuff, depending on, you know, where you're reading it and what you're reading. And people will ask, you know, is there any chance that Scientology could end in sort of a mass event kind of like what happened with the people's temple? And my response has always been, not not really because of the Scientologist belief in the afterlife. It's it's kind of like there's almost no point there. Organizationally speaking, there's almost no point in unaliving yourself because you're just going to come right back. But I feel like there's a flip side of that coin, whereas Scientologists have such little regard for the value of the physical body. In some respects, I find it surprising that things like that don't happen more of people going, well, this body's uh, not the best. I'm just going to roll the dice and try again. I'll see you guys in a couple days. I'll, I'll be verbal in a couple years, you know, ha hang in there for me. I'm coming back guys. You'll I mean, recognize me. You'll, you'll recognize the energy. It's the, the big, <laughs> I'll have that big dick Thetan energy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They'll recognize I mean, me. They'll be like, this baby loves enchiladas. Oh, it's Reese. <laughs> I knew that was you. Yeah. Oh, man. So it yeah. is surprising it doesn't happen more often considering how nonchalant people are in Scientology about, about death. Yeah. I remember Alex Carr, the qualification sec at uh, Casey Org, said to me once, he was like, I don't understand why this obsession with death. He was like, it's literally like getting out of one car and getting into another. He was like, it's no big deal. And I just thought uh, that's, I don't know. It, that bothers me. It's just such a weird, I mean, I was going to say, maybe you haven't experienced a super real loss in your life, but his wife did die. And I showed you the video of him at the funeral. Just, he really did have that attitude. Yeah. And not only that, he went and replaced her on the training program that she died on. Just, yep, just overnight. He didn't go be with her when she was dying, but he showed up after she died and just took her place. Yeah. Someone asks here, unknown person, how would they know L. Ron Hubbard has reincarnated and it's just not some 10-year-old that cheated the e-meter or something? Um, unknown person, thank you for the question. Well, the truth is, they wouldn't ever know because such a thing isn't possible. So if we're talking about reality or, or just, just pure theory here, in reality, okay, in pure theory, the way they would know is L. Ron Hubbard wouldn't just reincarnate. He would reincarnate with full and total recall of his last 76 trillion years, which would include for sure perfect recall of his last life starting in 1911 to 1986. So L. Ron Hubbard, all he would have to do if he was really reincarnating was to come back in whatever body. It wouldn't matter if it was male, female, wouldn't matter what race it was or anything, and just give perfect recall of events that only L. Ron Hubbard and the person he was talking to would know of. It wouldn't even it wouldn't even involve the emitter as far as um, my, in my, you know, how I would envision the situation, the emitter wouldn't even be involved. It would be like, yeah, right. We're getting on the emitter. Hey, remember when you did X, Y, and Z and they're talking about something that happened in 1970, like that's how such a thing would be proven if it were possible. But the truth is there's no mechanism in place for someone to come back, uh, reincarnate in Scientology and, um, Actually, I, I, let me take it back. Reese, do you remember when Scientology was on this promotional kick of giving people passports up the bridge to total freedom? Does that were you aware of that effort? Doesn't ring a bell. So they would they would they were issuing actual like physical passports. Like it looks exactly like a passport. But instead of being a passport for countries, it was a passport for levels of the bridge.
And okay. the way this thing was marketed is that your passport would be filed away when you died and you could just come back in your next life and claim your identity and your passport. Uh, it, it's a, it, your passport would serve as the documentation for all the Scientology you did in your previous life. Now, th the whole thing's purely a marketing gimmick because you know what else would serve as the documentation for what you did? Your auditing files? Like what's the say, purpose of that? Your, your PC files. I know. It was a pure marketing gimmick, but it was a gimmick specifically designed for coming back next lifetime. So, um, but, but even still, even still, there's no real, I have never heard of a Scientologist coming back and giving the exact name of who they were before and being credited with the levels of the bridge they had attained in the past life. And, you know, if you die with money on account, technically speaking, if you come back and claim your real identity, that money that you left on account, you're, you're supposed to be able to claim in your next lifetime. Never heard of that happening ever, ever, ever. And so anyway, when I say there's no real mechanism in place, it's almost like Scientologists don't even take it seriously in a rubber meets the road kind of fashion, even though rhetorically Scientologists take it very, very seriously. Isn't that interesting, actually, that you bring that up? I, um, they talk about it a lot. LRH talks about it a lot, the coming back and obviously the billion contract and, and the Sea Org. It really isn't talked about much, though, within the church. Like, you're right. There are not, like, I never heard Dan go, did you hear that so-and-so came back? We got to pull those PC folders because that was, that's never occurred. I remember one time growing up, my dad told a story about someone in LA checking back in. He turned 18 and he showed up and he said, I'm reporting for duty. And the receptionist was like, mm, here, take this book and read it and tried to give him Dianetics. And he said, well, I'm happy to, but I've already read it 25 times and I'm a Dianetics auditor. That doesn't happen. And it it's, doesn't it's happen. just interesting because they talk about it happening a lot. But it being an actual member, you never hear about it. Never, and L ever. as far as LRH coming back, what I always heard was he is, what was it called? Target two? Is that what mm -hmm. it was called? That he's, that's, of course, they're going to make that up because people will start to question, why isn't this guy back? Well, I was always told he's off doing, I think they called it Target two. And he was setting up like on another planet and spreading, spreading the good word. That's what I was told as well. When I when I found out that the the, the Sea Org members at the international base were told that Elvron Hubbard would be returning, that was a shock to me because that's mm -hmm. the opposite of everything I was mm -hmm. ever told. Me too. Which is that he went off to Target 2 to get Scientology started, which, by the way, contradicts everything Elvron Hubbard said about OTs working best with other OTs and not to go off on your own. So that that's right. Wouldn't, wouldn't make sense. And and we were like, it was, that's why it was so important for us to work so hard to clear planet earth, because once we wrapped up the job here, we were all supposed to go off and join L run Hubbard on target too. That's right. That's what I was told. Now, now here is a crazy scenario to imagine. And this goes back to the Jim Jones people's temple analogy. Not that I think this would ever occur. I don't think this would ever occur. But the foundation has been laid. If David Miscavige wanted to, for some crazy reason, he could hold an event, a, a, an international worldwide briefing, just like they did when L. Ron Hubbard passed. And he could say, look, L. Ron Hubbard has been in touch. And he said, um, the forces uh, against us here on Earth are just too great. Um, we've made a mistake and he thinks it's our, our time would be better spent if we all went and joined him on target too. And um, so I, what I need you guys to do is wrap up your affairs, uh, drop your bodies and um, follow the light. L. Ron Hubbard, uh, he's, he's shining the light for us. Just follow the light on the target too. You can't miss it. Take a first turn, uh, you know, take the first left <laughs> at the station and uh, you'll be uh, zapped right into a body on target too. Now, if you went past the sign, you went too far. Don't go. Yeah, if, you, if you see this, you went too far. Go back. Yeah. If you, you pass. Make a great point. Yeah. <laughs> How many people do you know that would follow that advice from David Miscavige? I could tell you a lot. I think at least 20% of the Scientologists would immediately comply. Agreed. Yeah. And I think a lot of uh, half the Scientologists would be like, are you shitting me, dude? I'm only here so I don't lose my family. 
I'm out. <laughs> because most of them probably do feel that way. Yeah. It's totally a state of fear. Yeah. It's yeah. like Marshawn Lynch. I'm just here so I don't get fined. Uh, that's an inside joke. Um, Are you shitting me? I'm just here so I don't lose. <laughs> that's not funny, but it is because it's so realistic. Yeah, but I guarantee exactly. you, Brenda, my mom and I talked about this. Like if, if they said, go jump off a cliff, Brenda would d absolutely do it. Yeah. There are some diehards who would go, oh, okay. So we're going to go follow him now. We're going to meet him. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that was when you told me that story, I was like, oh, come on. We got to talk about this. This is wild. Uh, and you mentioned something there about, you know, L. Ron Hubbard says that Thetans are, are supposed to not, they're supposed to be a static. I, I don't know if this is the real definition of a static because I just grew up in a cult, but how L. Ron Hubbard defined a static was something without any wavelength, without any position in space or time. And he says Thetans are a static. In other words, it, 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 it's like the prime mover unmoved. It doesn't exist. It has to even choose to allow itself to be located in space and time. It's all very confusing, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but so a Thetan could theoretically drop a body and just sort of check out of the physical universe for a bit so that, you know, so as not to experience the passage of time and then just come back to the physical universe whenever they want. And so for some reason, uh, Doug believes that his father, to, it was so important to occupy Huxley's body that he just decided to hang out for some unspecified amount of time. Like it's a weird, it's, 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 it's a weird priority to have, <laughs> especially since Huxley was not a figment in anyone's imagination. When this father allegedly made this decision just to, you know, hang, hang on his theta laurels on the local electric wire or whatever. He would say waiting he was, for yeah. Huxley to be born. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing Is better to do. Is Doug OT8? Doug is clear. And you know what's weird about that? Doug and Brenda both have had their OT levels paid for since like the 80s. Mm -hmm. And he is clear. Brenda's good doing the alternate route. He is, it's like the new clear, you know, where people thought they were clear and then they made him go back. He's, he's officially clear. He has had them paid for and he won't go do them. And he wouldn't go do them because he didn't want to leave Huxley. Hmm. <laughs> People were really pushing him, but because you have to be gone for so long, right? When you go to your OT levels, it's at least like six to eight months. And when they say that, that usually means a year or more, right? Yeah. Um, he never wanted to leave Huxley. He said he would do it when he was older because he needed him as a child, which mm -hmm. is even sadder because he totally left Huxley hanging. Yeah. Absolutely unbelievable. Um, all right, let's see a couple, a couple comments here. And then we have another, another um, subject we're going to get into Jake M. I just finished a billion years. It was a great book. Highly recommend it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can, um, you can get a billion years anywhere, anywhere books are sold. And Mike Rinder narrates his own audiobook. I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, unknown person. Okay. We already did that one. Steve Britton says, I think it's Reese's mm -hmm. camera. She might be streaming at 480. You're probably right, Steven. We just don't know how she changed those settings. Um, and uh, we'll just have to tackle. We'll have to tackle that. I'm going to switch, guys. We talked about this before, but I'm going to move to my own office and I will have it like Aaron. I'm going to have my Mac set up with my phone. It just is going to be like another few days. Indeed. Okay. Dino Dank wants to know, Reese, did you know Kathy Orinder. Gosh, that sounds familiar. Does it to you, Aaron? No, I don't think so, though. I don't think so. Do you know? Okay. Um, I'm curious. Do you know if you're asking that because Kathy Orinder was like a Kansas City person, or or what? Um, because if you know what city they were in, we'd probably be able to find someone to confirm if that person was like a known individual in Scientology in that area. Okay, let's see. Mitzi Francis. Question. The concept that this life holds no real value has been used to inspire people to sacrifice themselves for a cause for centuries. What would Scientologists die for, if anything? Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to note that when you say what would they die for, they wouldn't even consider they were dying. They were just dropping a body. 
Getting out of that car. So it's not, it's a really strange contradiction to chat about this for a second because I don't know that I'd be comfortable going so far as to say that Scientologists show a blatant disregard for their physical health, but I might have my own anecdotal, you know, experiences popping up in my head when I say that. Do you, do you feel that, I, I mean, L. Ron Hubbard certainly seemed to have a particular disregard for his physical health with how much he smoked. Uh, the guy t- clearly never exercised a day in his life after the age of 20. Um, uh, I, I've always been startled by how he did not physically take care of himself. Um, but generally speaking, Scientologists tend to be very health conscious. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. But again, that's kind of anecdotal. What, what, what was your experience? Well, it's funny you say that. Doug told me that he read, ton- and tell me if you've read this. I had never heard this, but Doug told me that LRH like killed his body several times and he would just mock up a new body. He said that there was somewhere where he wrote that like he was totally destroyed in a car accident, but he just mocked up a new body. And then that's how he went from like different country to other countries. He wouldn't, he would just. <laughs> that's news to me, Reese. <laughs> <laughs> clearly you, it was different you, in the midwest do you mean do you mean using like wolverine like powers to heal his body or to create a whole new body i loved wolverine um no he mocked up created a whole new body he once destroyed his body in a car wreck and wow. it was like a blown to smithereens I remember this crazy essay or article hubbard wrote about how he had an exact look alike that he had multiple exact lookalikes that was running around planet earth, creating trouble for him by getting into all sorts of trouble. And people thought it was him. I remember him doing something like that, but that's different than what you're talking about. I love that we have totally different stories. Like there's a lot of things where (laughs) it rings a bell, Um, but they're really out there stories. But as far as Scientologists being health conscious, I would say that's half and half. Like some of them are extreme. I knew some of them that were like runners and only ate spinach and uh, drink electrolytes. <laughs> and that was it. Salt and potassium all day long. And yeah. then you have, I mean, you would have just big overweight people that didn't care. It's true. You really get a mixed bag. Yeah. And it's funny because no matter which, um, no matter where on the spectrum a Scientologist falls about you know, how health conscious they are. Every one of them will tell you that Scientology is the reason they live that way. Like they will selectively seize on certain things L. Ron Hubbard said to, to, to uh, justify where their lifestyle is the ideal lifestyle. If you're a good Scientologist and yet there's a lack of consistency. Yeah. I like to be a little bit of both myself. When I was at the org, I was like, definitely I'll take some cheese enchiladas, but give me the salt and potassium and vitamin C. So I, so I balance it out. Yeah, definitely doing what LRH said. The cell salts, and, of course. And looking like him at the same time, same, <laughs> same chubby tummy. <sighs> uh, yeah. It's, it's weird. It's yeah. like having a super overweight, like doctor that smokes in 2023. It's like, huh, that doesn't really fit you know, the description. And so it's weird that he was so out of shape. It is weird that he was so out of shape. Um, It looks like he never got his teeth cleaned. No. I mean, I hear stories of him being afraid of going to the dentist because he's going to be PDH and turned into a a sleeper agent for the CIA or some shit. Like, uh, you know, the more people I talked to who knew him back then, particularly Janice Grady and, and her sister and other people, they're like, by the time L. Ron Hubbard went off in 1980 into seclusion, he was already going crazy. And that's if you don't think he was already crazy before that, but like actually losing his mind crazy, you know, that's not just sad. A, a master manipulator. So the question, what would Scientologists die for? I want to say they would, most of them would at least claim to be willing to die for anything that would forward the aims of Scientology. But uh, it's easy to say such things. It's <laughs> not as easy to follow through, you know. I have a question for you, Aaron. Speaking yeah. of dentists, so like his teeth were seriously like rot looking. Do you think, because I know there was uh, mixed emotions there on dentists with Scientologists. I know I'm still in a group 
of Scientologists on Facebook. I somehow haven't been kicked out. And there's a lot of talk on that. Like, is there any local Scientology dentists? Cause I don't want to like, they're afraid of the dentist because of, we know why nitrous. Right. I mean, I know Doug was a dentist. That was a huge thing. Nitrous. It's the most dangerous drug according to what is that in Dianetics or is that science of survival where it's like the most hypnotic. Oh, oh I know what you're ta talking about. Yeah. Nitrous oxide. It's a very common, it's the gas. Yeah. Yeah. So I've never had like uh, something, you know, they call it sedation dentistry is becoming more and more popular, right? Where you get mildly mm -hmm. sedated. It's is that, gas. Are they, they're using nitrous for that, right? Yeah. Yep. So Scientologists would be terrified that they're just having implants and engrams just laid in every time they go to the dentist and you know, they might come in and shoot up the org the next day or something. Absolutely. That was a big deal from my org that, um, I just know this because, um, Brenda was always telling me it's the most, it's the word LRH says it's the most dangerous drug. Okay. So Huxley had to have a ton of dental work done when he was two and Doug couldn't do it. I had to take him to a pediatric dentist and he actually had to have general for it because he had to have like three baby root canals and caps and whatever. But then years later, Huxley had to have something done and he got the gas and I said, okay to it. And I didn't think it was a big deal. And I got into so much trouble for that. I had to read so many policies on it. And um, he's had it many times since. As a matter of fact, he just did recently. And he was like, hopefully they're going to give me that gas, right? Like he, li <laughs> he liked it. <laughs> wow. So I've always been somewhat infatuated with having clean teeth. So I go to the dentist all the time. So um, I've never... I've never needed to get um, any of the gas because I've never needed like a root canal or anything like that. Thank God, because I don't think I can handle it. I am the biggest puss when it comes to pain. Oh, my God. I cannot. I cannot handle it. That makes it. sense. That adds up. I can see that. <laughs> that, that tells us a lot about you. <laughs> yes. Um, strength and tolerance for pain are entirely disrelated. In fact, they might be inversely correlated. I don't know. Um, um I've had a ton of dental work done myself. I've had many root canals. I've never had the gas in my life because I get Novocaine shots. You can have that option too. Mm. But for kids, especially kids, they give them the gas because you, it's hard to give a little kid a shot probably. Yeah. And it works fine and it wears off quick. And, and so I just wondered your opinion on that because here in Kansas City, it was talked about a lot and I got into so much trouble for that. For letting him have that and brenda was like you could have totally ruined his eternity on this like we're gonna have to find the right when he goes into session like locate what was said and um, Do you know it's funny this is i think what, what you're talking about here's a perfect example of scientologists almost picking and choosing the things that they think are most important and running with it and here's why i say that you remember in dianetics i'm going to use coded language here because i don't want to say the words in dianetics and this was before you know, he had tried to introduce the idea of an immortal spiritual being, right? Like when Dianetics came out, um, there's nothing in that book about past lives or reincarnation. In that book, he is running with the assumption that anything bad that happened to you while you were in the womb is the earliest time anything bad could have happened to you. Are you mm -hmm. tracking with me so far? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, because L. Ron Hubbard was running with that idea, he claimed in that book that attempted... I guess we can say with 33 minutes that attempted abortions that failed and the physical and psychic damage that you did to the fetus by attempting to do that was pretty much the cause of all human misery and suffering because those create early engrams mm -hmm. that are, that are the, 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 the basic on the chain of everything bad that happens to you in your life. And in other words, that that women throughout the uh, eons have been destroying humankind by constantly trying to do this. I mean, the way L. Ron Hubbard described it, it's like every woman apparently tried this multiple times every time they were pregnant is sort of the picture that he was painting. He sure did. And, this, and in Dianetics, this was just considered the source of all bad things in the human race, the source of war, the source of everything. And yet when he then 
came up with Scientology and started talking about past lives, mil millions, billions, trillions of years ago, he changed his tune. He said, nothing that happens to you in this lifetime has any aberrative value of any kind whatsoever because it's not the earliest on the chain. The earliest mm -hmm. on the chain is millions, billions, and trillions of years ago. And yet you will still find people, Scientologists, worrying about things that L. Ron Hubbard said in Dianetics that L. Ron Hubbard has since completely contradicted and thrown out, but because you're not allowed to say that any tech is old or we don't use that anymore, they seize yeah. upon it like it's still very, very important. Yeah. Now, we're spending an awful lot of time talking about stuff that anyone else is going to go, this sounds like total horseshit. Why are we even talking about this? It's because Scientologists themselves cannot be consistent on what parts of what L. Ron Hubbard said should still carry a lot of weight. Correct. And this thing of like your, your, you know, the people, you know, crying to high heaven about whether Huxley got nitrous is such a good example of that. That's very true. You know, so yeah. much to the point, I just thinking just real quick on that nitrous, Brenda showed up the day of his appointment when he, this was not, this was just a couple of years ago. Huxley's had nitrous a few times. Um, and I've lied and tried to make it seem like he's not going to get it. She showed up to his appointment and asked to pull the dentist aside and asked him not to do it. And <laughs> that her husband's a dentist. And she was like, and if I need you to keep very quiet in there when you do the work, because with kids too, at a pediatric dentist, it's really cool. Like they give them headphones and they can watch a TV. Like they can pick a movie when they're getting the work done. Um, she was like, no movies. We don't want any, we want silence. I was so embarrassed that she did that one. Cause I'm his mother. So it's like, you're bypassing me. <laughs> You know, it's like you're, I was so, and, and the guy is such a cool dentist. And I was like, so imagine too, what that's like for, because people do it all the time in Scientology going and being like, I'm telling a doctor, I'm going to need you to do this. I'm going to need you to do that. I'm going to need you to follow these guidelines. That is such a slap in the face to me, to doctors. It's true. It's so rude. It's so disrespectful. And you look like a goon. You look like a nut. In some of the yeah. Scientology films, there's like little clips, like little trailers and everything. And you'll have like, you know, a, a trained Scientology auditor showing up to a scene where something horrible has happened and nobody knows what to do. And they show up and they're like, it's okay. I'm a Scientology auditor. <laughs> Help has arrived. Stand back, doctors. Only a Scientologist knows what to do here. Tom they Cruise, they get over here, Tom. Uh, Will Ferrell says that in uh, one of those movies. What, oh, Talladega Nights. Did you see that? He's on yeah. fire and he's like running around. He's like, help me, Tom Cruise. Somebody get Tom Cruise. <laughs> it's so true. Those videos uh, really do make it look like, like, okay, we're good. Help is here. Get the doctors out of here. There's a Scientologist on the scene. Yeah, yeah. that's a real thing, <clears throat> guys. That is absolutely mm -hmm. a real thing. All right. Tarkina Meyer is asking, but do the rank and file Scientologists know all about the reincarnation and space alien stuff? I thought that was only if you had progressed up the bridge. Good question, Tarkina. Everything that we have discussed in this video is uh, stuff lower level Scientologists would be aware of. The only, the only big reveal that you get on the OT levels is about Xenu and the body thetans every and we haven't even mentioned xenu and the body thetans in this conversation we've been talking about regular thetans uh scientologists have never even heard of a body thetan until they get to ot3 but yes they know all about the space alien stuff and the fifth invader forces and the Markabians and the implant Mark stations the Markabian Confederacy and the implant stations and the prison planets and exteriorizing to other solar systems and galaxies and, uh, mm -hmm. and even other universes. Like that's all lower level Scientology stuff. It's not in Dianetics. It's not in science of survival. Um, no. but it's in a lot, it's a, it's in a lot of the lower level materials. I feel like they kind of reel you in a little bit first, obviously before they start talking about that stuff. Yeah. But we all know, I mean, seasoned Scientologists know about all of that. And it's just normal conversation for sure. Yeah, it's not considered confidential. You're not going to get in trouble for talking about the Markabian invader forces. 
No, it's no different than Doug saying, I'm going to drop the body when Huxley has his first kid and dive right on into that like a little fish. No yeah, big exactly. deal. Exactly. Just a regular day. <laughs> Case Ventura. Reese is such a pleasant addition to SPTV. Well, Aww. you little pudding pop. Thank you. <laughs> That's so nice. You guys are uh, so nice. Thank you. Marilyn Honig, Coffee, Colts, and Crafts. If David Miscavige gets desperate enough, do you think he would do something that drastic? I think he'd say, you all go first. <laughs> he loves himself too much. Probably. So that's the thing. I don't think he would ever do something that drastic because I don't think it would ever serve him. That's the thing. It would not serve him or benefit him for that to occur. That's the only reason it wouldn't occur. Because if he thought it would serve him, I do think he would do that. What do you yeah. think? Yeah. I just think there's it's a money machine. So if he does that, he's going to lose. I mean, I, I don't know. The other thing about that is like it's worth billions. Is David Miscavige really using any of that for his own personal? Like he doesn't seem like he's living large. He's not like Joel Osteen. He doesn't have like, right? He Doesn't is he just quite, live on base? He, no, he lives on. No, he does not live on base anymore. I mean, the Hacienda Gardens he does. But for example, like in, in Clearwater, Florida, you know, he has. But the difference is he has an entire wing of the Hacienda Gardens renovated f to be a giant private space. The other Sea Org members are sleeping four to a bedroom. That's the difference. So, okay, so he does have like a giant space. It's just there with the rest of them. Yes. It's not off yes. base like some huge house. That's right. He's not renting some big mansion on the water in, in Bel Air Bluffs or anything like that. Um, but but the only reason he wouldn't is because he'd be exposed. He wouldn't be able to security would be a problem. You know, staying on the base handles his security problems. No, the base is very secure. Um, and if he wanted to go live in luxury, he could just go hang out in one of Tom Cruise's mansions. Like David Miscavige can do what he does from anywhere. Because what does he really do? Um, he he yeah he could just go hang out at Tom's place and, and Tom's got places all over the world. So this is one of the reasons why Mike said he doesn't think David Miscavige will ever flee the country to go into hiding because he can hide very effectively here in the United States at any number of places. Um, so yeah, yeah. Hmm. He uh, David Miscavige lives much more extravagantly than L. Ron Hubbard ever lived. That's for sure. Really? Oh, definitely. Most definitely. I mean, L. Ron Hubbard died in a motorhome. David Miscavige ain't been in a motorhome. <laughs> For whatever reason, I thought LRH lived pretty lavishly. Um, yeah. Not Didn't really. Didn't he have like a I ton mean, of Jaguars and like... Maybe. I don't know. Possibly. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Case Ventura hate it when I try to drop the body, but it's a number two. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. We all do. Uh, yes. When you think the only thing you're about to drop is your body, but it turns out it was something more. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. What is this? Lujoral. LRH picture with Joker makeup on lips a smack in. Yikes. That's a bad. That's what gives me a bad image. LRH, LRH pictures are scary without all that. Joker makeup on a on lips a smacking. I actually don't know what that means. That's I don't okay. either. That's all right. Um, what is this? Marilyn. Aaron, do you hide other gems like Reese on your informants list? Tell them we want to meet them too. Reese is both hilarious and lovely. Marilyn, you little yard gnome. That's so cute. <laughs> I have a name yes, for everybody. I, I, they seem to like it. <laughs> I've changed Reese in my phone from Reese, Kansas City to definitely not Reese in Kansas City. I think that will have Scientology fooled, don't you think? Yeah, they, they're not fooled. They know who I am. They were outside that's my all, house that's yesterday. That's right. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Yeah, all my secret informants, I just make it clear in my, in my contact info. I put definitely not a secret informant, and that way Scientology will never really know what to do, so. So when they tap your phone, that's what you yeah. have it now when they see it. They, okay. Yeah, that's that's what they teach you in tradecraft school, you know. Um, okay. Ka, 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 uh, I always get this wrong. 
I'm going to say Kyla, Kyla McDonald. What is the difference in, uh, what is the difference between suicide and deciding to drop your body? Suicide is a crime, but what is the difference? So in Scientology, they would say that suicide would be if you actually proactively took measures to kill your body. I believe that Scientologists think that dropping the body means you basically just make a decision and you, you more or less just die in your sleep. You just die in your sleep. You just die suddenly. You just poof, drop dead. So you drop dead of natural causes, but because you decided to. Um, is that how you've always understood? If there was a distinction here, is that is that what you would say? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. I would say that's what I would say. But have, do you know anyone that just decided to drop the body and did? No, it's total. It's a total myth. Everyone that I know in Scientology, almost every, and I know a lot of people that have died. Um, all of them, I think, were cancer. Yeah. And they all die in the hospital. And it's like, well, if they were just going to decide to drop the body, why did they bother going to the hospital then? Right. Why, why'd you drag it on for so long? And then once you finally lose the battle, everyone says he decided it was time to go. Well, what took him so long? Did he not? How come he didn't decide not to have cancer? Like, yeah, I never understood that. Like the whole dropping of, they talk about it, like just dropping the body. Why can't you just yeah. drop the body? Like you said, I mean, why wouldn't you just go to bed and die? If, if you really were in full control of that, we would all do that. Exactly. Exactly. So there you go, um, Kyla. Thank you. A uh, Butch Copper. Why does Scientology encourage Seerg members to terminate pregnancies when the child might be L. Ron Hubbard returning? Uh, they feel he will just grab the next body. You know, I would answer this by saying, I mean, realize, guys, this isn't supposed to make perfect sense, right? We're talking about a bunch of bullshit on top of bullshit on top of bullshit. But if I were David Miscavige and I was having to explain this, I would probably say L. Ron Hubbard would never commit the overt of trying to pick up a body of two Sea Org members, knowing that it would pull those Sea Org members out of the Sea Org. L. Ron Hubbard would never do something like that. He would just pick up the body of some super rich Scientology family that was having a baby um, to, you know, to guarantee that he wasn't going to be born into a family where they were going to put him in the care of psychs <laughs> or put him yeah. on psych drugs or, you know, put him into the public school system where he would get psych influenced. Uh, so I have to what say though, think? Aaron, I never thought of him coming back that way. I always, as, as a true believer Scientologist before I was a double agent, switched careers, I always really thought he wouldn't be born and like raised. I, I, the way Doug made it sound like how he would mock up a new body. I always thought he would just show up as an adult. I mean, if he's OT 15 and he's all powerful, why would he have to be born and learn how to talk again? And he, why would he waste time on that? Right. Or he would just be, get popped out, you know, come out, come into the world as a, basically a boss baby, the only newborn able to fully uh, speak and walk and talk and everything. Um, okay. But, but, but you introduce an interesting component that I, I'd never really considered that, that an all powerful L Ron Hubbard would just create out of, you know, just Manifest. manufacture a grown body and start occupying it. Yeah. Why, why would you go through school and yeah. he wouldn't do, I mean, I never thought he would do that. I thought he would just appear as an adult. That's interesting. Now, if that's, if that's what he was going to do, they wouldn't have expected him to take an 18 year leave of absence. The, the, the 18 year LOA or whatever it was, was supposed to be for him to uh, grow up. Um, and right. Yeah. It's interesting, though, that every Scientologist is going to give you a different answer because everything we're talking about here was ne is never spelled out in Scientology. True. The fact that the people at international management were told something different about his return than all of the Scientologists in the world is really weird. It is kind of weird that there isn't like a written plan that he left, right? Like that we right. could all adhere to and know this is how it's going to happen. This is how he's going to come back. It is weird that it's like mysterious. Everybody has a different answer. That's right. He and that's also why that. like, that's right. And it's also like if L. Ron Hubbard really had selected David Miscavige to take over Scientology, don't you think he would have called David Miscavige up to the ranch 
where L. Ron Hubbard was living in a motorhome and say, all right, man, I'm about to drop it. Let's have one final meeting, give you my blessing, have some witnesses. L. Ron Hubbard did call some people up to the ranch. David Miscavige wasn't one of them. <laughs> right. You know, that's an interesting point, too. If he was so all powerful. See, this is stuff I just don't. It never occurred to me because you just can't think like that when you're in Scientology or question it. But wouldn't he have actually addressed all of us as Scientologists and said, I'm going to go on to phase or two or target two. And uh, here's Mr. Miscavige. He's going to take over. Seriously. Wouldn't you think yep. that he would be a little more um, organized? You would like that instead of Miss Savage coming out three days after he died going, um, I mean, he looked white as a ghost in that speech too. He looked uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, wouldn't LRH, if he really was going to just drop it, like they all say they're going to do, wouldn't he kind of give a, a speech all on his own or, or do something in writing? That's right. A pre-recorded, he would, he used to put out these lectures called Ron's journals. Yes. Which were these recorded lectures that he would go, would go out to all Scientologists in the world. He That's would have right. at the bare minimum recorded a Ron's journal lecture. It's almost like all of this is all just a bunch of bullshit. Like it's a big cult or something. I know. I feel like I'm being lied to. I know. I can't shake that feeling myself. Um, okay. Pam says newborn grandson today. Nine weeks premature. We'll just love him for him. Love you both. <laughs> oh, Pam, that's so exciting. A little newborn blueberry. Oh, wow. Well, I hope he gets out of the that. hospital as, as quickly as he can. Um, I hope so. My first my first daughter was born just a little too premature where, um, uh, you know, there, there's a, a line where they have to keep them in the NICU even if they're mm -hmm. like, okay, like, uh, so, so my, our first daughter was in the, uh, the NICU for a while until she, uh, I guess could keep, they have all, all sorts of metrics, it must eat this much of food, yep. this, uh, you know, and it was a, it was a, it was a nightmare. Um, yep. Huxley was in I the mean, NICU you know, for three weeks. Yeah. You know, first time parents, the baby's in the NICU, like it's stressful as hell. So I hope everyone's Scary. uh, dealing with it well, Pam and, uh, um, welcome, Welcome to the world, newborn uh, grandson of Pam. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Montana mystery. If LRH waits too much longer to return, will there be anyone still around who will have personally known him? How can he prove it's really him? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, Miscavige knew L. Ron Hubbard, and Miscavige is only like 62 or something years old. So Miscavige could be kicking around for another 30 years, you know, but uh, let's be real. L. Ron Hubbard's not coming back, guys. You know, though, Aaron, I do want to say, like, just, I never, th did you think of that until we just had this conversation? He would have, We there was all the Ron's Journals lectures. Wouldn't he have even just had, like, a book on my, my plan for my exit? Here's what I'm going to do. He seemed like a very bullet point kind of guy anyway. You know, I, I mean, there's an answer for every single thing in Scientology. If you have a question, go look it up. There's an answer. Why wasn't there that it's so vague? Why wasn't yeah. there an answer um, or a lecture yeah. or something where he said, this is my plan, everybody, so that it can't get screwed up so that yeah. you're not being lied to. Like, here's if it doesn't if it doesn't go off of this, it's not right. And, and the real answer is that by the time he died, he was severely mentally and physically ill. That's just the answer. And that that's the big secret. That's the big secret. He didn't Did he have a stroke. Finish he he died he died of multiple things. I mean, at the end of the, at the end of the day, what you die of is heart failure, and what leads to heart failure. He had a stroke. I I just don't. I'm not familiar enough with the details to know if that's the exact cause of death listed. I just don't remember. Um, but he was very physically and mentally ill. Uh, spoiler alert: didn't finish the OT levels. Guys, uh, was trying to get rid of his body thetans up until the day that he died, and that's Miscavige's big secret: that L. Ron Hubbard failed. And that shortly before his death, he even said, I failed. I failed. What? That's what that's why I say L. Ron Hubbard believed his own bullshit. He was trying to get rid of his body thetans until the day he died. So he believed in that bullshit. And he believed that he had failed because he couldn't resolve it. So um wow. that's the, that's the truth. Uh Taylor says, How to be a cult leader. A new six episode series on Netflix, but no mention of Scientology. Do you think they didn't discuss because Scientology is so litigious? Very interesting documentary. You know, I don't know. Um, Taylor, I feel like by now, 
most people in the entertainment industry are coming to realize that Scientology hasn't actually sued anybody in close to 30 years now, um, other than Debbie Cook. And that ended very, very badly for Scientology. You know, anyone in the entertainment industry can see that Scientology didn't sue Leah Remini. They didn't sue Mike Rinder. They didn't sue A&E. Uh, they didn't sue the production company that produced the Aftermath show. So it's, it's hard for me to... Um, I, so I don't know why they don't mention Scientology in that Netflix series, but uh, hmm. I'll have to check it out. Have you heard of that one? I saw something about it um, huh. somewhere. I saw like an advertisement for it. I'm kind of surprised they wouldn't mention Scientology. It does make you yeah. wonder why. Yeah. Okay, going rogue. I'd be very interested in hearing what you think the life will be like for the 30,000 plus members still in when it all crumbles. Guys, most Scientologists live in the real world. Only a few thousand, three, five, uh, pff, no more than 6,000 Scientologists are in the C organization. If you're a public Scientologist or you're a staff member Scientologist, you live in the real world. Um, I also don't think that Scientology will have some like very single like watershed moment when it all comes crumbling down. Uh, I think it'll just get smaller and smaller and smaller. It'll become more and more irrelevant. I think there will always be Scientologists to one degree or another. Um, when they, when they lose their tax exempt status, uh, the decline will become more precipitous, but, um, uh, what it'll be like is everyone will be free and happy to live their lives without being spied on and looking over their shoulder all the time. That's, that's yeah. how I see it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's going to come crashing down. I mean, I don't know. We don't know, but I think it's exactly what you said. I think it's just going to get smaller and smaller. Yeah. Okay. Case Ventura. I know a stuck OT seven trying to drop the body because things are no bueno to reset and come back to join the sea org so sad crazy backstory tell y'all on the down low this is exactly what we're talking about yeah this is exactly what we're talking about yep they have um an assist somebody to leave the body like that an won't assist. die they call it the final cs or the last cs that's right that's right and um yeah. Creepy, really creepy stuff. Dino Dank, Dino Dank. Uh, Kathy was a major Kansas City public from Wichita. She passed a couple of years ago. My consideration of the veteran staff in Kansas City when I was there was a bunch of DBs. <laughs> now, I wonder if we have that right about Wichita. Wichita was just a mission. That's the one that Kirstie Alley opened. And it wasn't yes. very big. It wasn't very big. Not at all. Um, but how far is Wichita from Kansas City? Do you know? Three hours. Okay. So if someone was a Scientologist in Wichita, it's possible you wouldn't even have known them. It's possible. But, you know, that last name does ring a bell for me. I just can't place the person. I feel like it is somebody that I would have come across. Kathy mm -hmm. Orender was what it was, I believe. That does sound familiar. Hmm. Okay, Steve Britton says, comment, the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. Therefore, it is impossible for LRH to have lives going back quadrillions of years. Uh, Steve, you're only talking about this universe. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of tunnels, Steve. And also, L. Ron Hubbard essentially said that none of the dating methods that scientists use to date the age of rocks or stars or anything, that it's just not valid or correct and that um sneaky little troublemaker thetans have played tricks on the physical universe scientists um and that they're all wrong and it's it's funny scientologists in some ways l ron hubbard is convinced uh scientologists that scientists know absolutely nothing about what they're talking about and yet and yet scientologists will still stop short of going down things like like flat earthers for example like i've never met a scientologist flat earther have you no 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 because the scientologist would go that's insane science has proven the earth isn't flat and you're like yeah dumbass science has proven the earth that universe isn't trillions of years old as well but you still believe that <laughs> 
Yeah, it's all contradicting. I mean, now that I'm out of the bubble and able to talk about this stuff, see, even Aaron back in, when did we do our first video when I was doxxed? That was in March. I was, right? Yeah. I was doxxed in uh, January, New Year's Eve event. I haven't even really thought about this stuff since starting my own channel and actually talking about it actively. And now that I were talking about it, I'm like, this is nuts. Why didn't I see any of this? Why didn't I think about this? Because we're in a, we're in a bubble or a box, however you want to put it. And there's no windows or doors We're piece of veal. Like you can't, there is no way to think outside of that. Yeah. But even now I'm like, Whoa, it's like just little by little I'm unlearning or peeling off an onion. And it's like, wow. I never thought of that. It's kind of sad. It's simple, but it's just new stuff I'm thinking about now that I'm able to think for myself. That's you know? great. That's great. Christine, when Reese moves office, will we see her pets? Uh, yes, guys, you will see them. They are wherever I am. They don't care about anybody in this house, but me. I mean, yeah, you're just going down to the basement, right? Yeah, there's a really nice office in the basement that we haven't ever used. And uh, so I'm going to move down there. So, yes, they will be with me. And, you know, since Jeff never goes to the basement, I may rescue and adopt a few more pets and he won't see them down there. So stay tuned. <laughs> nice. All right. Free Zenu Project asks, do Scientologists know when LRH was practicing the occult with Jack Parsons? He did psychedelics. Um. L. Ron Hubbard did talk a lot about his time with Jack Parsons. I do not remember L. Ron Hubbard specifically talking about taking psychedelics, but I can tell you, I don't think Scientologists would care about that. Um, I, I know I wouldn't have cared. Uh, mm -hmm. L. Ron Hubbard sort of had this thing where he's like, in order to understand man, you have to get down into the dirt with him. You have to rub elbows with all sorts of civilizations and societies. And um, I mean, L. Ron Hubbard sort of bragged about being friends with uh, all sorts of uh, undesirable or degenerate or criminal elements. He's like, because in L. Ron Hubbard's view, the way he would explain this to a Scientologist is we are all the same. We are all suffering from the same illness, which is the reactive mind. And then later it's the body thetans and their reactive minds. And so I don't know, something like L. Ron Hubbard drinking or taking drugs or psychedelics, honestly, um, it wouldn't have been a big deal. I'm sure any mention in the lectures of if he ever did say that have been edited out for public relations reasons. Mm -hmm. I think Mark Hadley has said that. Would you have, would you have cared if you were like, if Elvin Hubbard was like, when I was uh, kicking around in LA with Jack Parsons, we were, we were getting high out of our minds. Would that have uh, colored your opinion of anything? I would have said, you want truffles? You got to get in the dirt with the pigs. Exactly. Do it, brother. Do it. That's right. Do those psychedelics. Mm -hmm. We'll respect you either way. Hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> Okay, Joni Cummings says, question, why would anyone want to come back to be a Scientologist? I love Reese. She's so sweet. I love Joni. I love her. Um, well, go ahead, Reese. I mean, first of all, <laughs> nobody but a Scientologist would want to come back and be a Scientologist, obviously. Right. And it's just, again, it's weird how they plan it. Or if there is a pregnant person, in my over here in the Midwest, they would go, who just died? Who do we know that just died? so they can identify who it is. Uh, why would anyone want to come back, Joni? I mean, seriously, when you are in, in the bubble Scientologist, you eat, sleep, and breathe Scientology. So, of course, I mean, it really is a, a whole new world that you get sucked into. You don't do anything outside of Scientology. So why wouldn't you want to come back and eat, sleep, and yeah. breathe that again? It's true. If you believe Scientology enough that you would disconnect from your grandson who you believe is actually your father but scientology is so important to you that you would disconnect from that person because you're told to then you believe in scientology enough to want to come back as a scientologist in your next lifetime that's stupid is as stupid does right yes yes, yes. very much so but they really take it seriously um like i said if you were on Joni earlier i mean doug is was planning to be Huxley's child. I mean, they, they make those plans. They don't plan their funerals. They're planning after the funeral. <laughs> I mean, right. really they're, they're, uh, it's a real thing. So it's bizarre. Right. It's bizarre, Joni. 
SPTV Tattoo Warrior is back. One of my lives, our baby Reese is getting all grown up. <laughs> Did I say that? I don't know. I mean, you must have. I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, oh, yeah. One of my lives. Oh, I get to tell me you're doing your own live streams. Okay. Oh, okay. I thought we were talking. I thought we were talking about Scientology talk, like back in one of my lives. <laughs> oh, I love past it. life. Thank you. That's nice. Lou Jorel says when Jack Nicholson played the Joker, he would smack his lips for effect. Ah, mm -hmm. like that. He I love that Batman. Joker. Yeah, yeah. He played a good Batman. one. Uh, ML says, Reese, uh, y'all kill me with the names, you sweet Petunia. Oh, my God. What a sugar cookie <clears throat> with extra sprinkles, too. Oh, my. Case Ventura, no too many Scientology families where the old discuss with pregnant families the desired transfer. It is really crazy, a.k.a. pudding pop. <laughs> <laughs> they like uh, it, Aaron. They like it. I know. Let it they roll. Do. Let it flow. Free Zenu Project says, uh, a DM done messed up. What if Surrey is LRH? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm sure That's it keeps creepy. little... I'm sure it keeps little Captain David Miscavige up all night, whether Surrey is going to come and uh, uh, storm the int base and declare David Miscavige publicly and take control. Uh, it's probably Miscavige's worst nightmare. Yeah. Um, all right, Joe Taylor. If anyone gives birth to an adult, it's LRH. <laughs> Facts. That's the truth. Uh, yeah. Case Ventura says, are hospitals... Uh-oh. Oh, are hospitals sometimes avoided? due to BTs in Scientology. So this is a hard one to answer, right? Because most Scientologists have never heard of body thetans or Xenu. Right. I've never heard anyone in Scientology say that you should stay away from hospitals. Have you? In a sense. I mean, they don't promote it. That's for sure. Like you, you better be no, but really, I mean, really, really needing it. No, but I mean, I've never heard like be, beware guys. A stay, if you can help it, stay away from a hospital. No, uh, not at all. For some spiritual reason. Not at all. Yeah. Okay. Rue says, Reese, come visit our family in Puerto Vallarta. We will treat you to the best tacos. Aaron, that was fancy how you said it. I love Rue and I would love to do that. You know, I've gotten some invites to people, people's homes. I, I, like I said, I would have been killed by Ted Bundy, Ted Bundy because I would have just gone off into the forest with him. I hope these invites are real, guys, because I'm going to come see you. Please don't murder me. I want to get some tacos with you, Rue. I hope <laughs> it's real. Awesome. Gina says, oh, wow. Uh, Butch's question made me think of one. Does Scientology theology say when a Thetan attaches to a body, like at conception or birth? This is a good one. Uh, be well, because I never studied the OT levels myself, I have asked tons of people who have about this very fact and I do not get a lot of consistent answers because I don't think the answer to this question was not particularly important in the process of auditing the OT levels. Um, I honestly don't know if there's one right answer to this question. I remember reading that um, the Thetan picks up the body like right at birth. So it's I remember that as well, Leon. but then... I remember hearing that as well, but then you wouldn't have prenatal engrams if there was no thetan in that body to go unconscious. Unless a body without a thetan can still get an engram. But see, this gets into things where L. Ron Hubbard didn't necessarily specify about this stuff because getting into the weeds in areas of like this was not considered important to the delivery of auditing. Right. True. Um, so uh, now, now look, when a Thetan attaches to a body, oh, oh, okay. So this is asking about Thetan, not body Thetan. Right, right. So the pro, okay. So let's just talk through this for a second. In Dianetics, L. Ron Hubbard talks about prenatal engrams, but he also wasn't talking about Thetans. Then later he's talking about Thetans. The most common thing I remember hearing is that the Thetan picks up the body just before birth. That's what I, that's what I've most commonly heard. Mm -hmm. Like I also heard that they will pick the body, um, but they won't like, you know, dive in yet. Like the little, like a little clown fish. They wait. Oh, they'll just like hover around waiting for the body. They hover around. Yeah. 
they just they put a little tag on it that says taken the seats yeah. taken shotgun Dibs. they might play a little game of musical chairs just before the birth to figure out who gets the body right right yeah, no seriously though sense. like they 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 choose the body um but what if somebody else sneaks in and steals your parking spot yeah revenge of the body snatchers for sure yeah scientology body snatchers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right joe taylor says do you guys feel that l ron hubbard's main goal was to destroy christianity no i don't think l ron hubbard cared at all about christianity or other religions no. for that matter yeah no i don't think so yeah god you're heavy uh Andy Fabulous says they go to the hospital because they started reading OT3 and said, holy effing LRH, somebody get me a Bible priest and rosary beads. All right. Thank I you. I like Andy. your enthusiasm, Andy. I like that. <laughs> Joe Taylor, what, LR, what LRH said is I've failed. Was that because he didn't destroy Christianity? No, it's because he didn't get rid of his body thetans. He felt his body thetans were haunting him. He was literally possessed. Thought he was possessed by these body thetans. It's amazing more Scientologists don't have full on psychotic breaks thinking that they're being possessed by all these, you know, half dead alien souls. It's crazy. You know, why do you think that the body thetans is an upper level thing? I mean, as crazy as all the other stuff, the Mark Ab Confederacy, Doug jumping into Huxley's kids, you know, why are body thetans held confidential? That's not any crazier than anything else. I know. I mean, my best guess is just that he had to have, he had to have this whole other confidential level, confidential section that would cause the lower level people to stick around, even if they didn't think they were getting everything they hoped for. Well, and when, when you're paying hundreds of thousands, you gotta have you gotta hold something back, right? I mean, that's just for that's the big my show. Sense of it. That's my show. sense of it, you know. Yeah. Um, hug a haggis, <laughs> hug a haggis 66. So, Scientology will go Ow. from being a grape to a raisin. Yep, exactly. Just like that. Cat hair everywhere. Uh, yeah, that's how I feel about it. It's actually a good way to put it. Yes. Yeah. They'll just turn into a, a, a prune. Yeah. Lil Boozy Burt, do Scientologists have any comments, official or unofficial, on the UFO UAP press hearings? Well, Scientologists are true believers in the alien phenomena because they believe that the alien psychiatrists are the ones who are imprisoning us on this planet and man the implant stations on the far side of the moon and Venus and all sorts of other stuff like that. So right. Scientologists believe aliens are real and they are not our friends. And they, uh, I mean, you pretty much have to believe that if you're a Scientologist. You know, guys, I was told, and Aaron, were you told this? I was told aliens don't come here. And if they do, it's because they got lost and it was by mistake because this is the dumping planet. Everybody in this galaxy looks at Earth as hell. That's what, um, it's a slave planet. That's what LRH said. That's what he told me. Yeah. And he said, we were dumped here on this planet. That's what he told me. <laughs> we were dumped here on this planet because it's a, a, a piece of shit garbage outpost on the yep. far, you know, the far, the, what do they call them? Uh, the swirls? I don't know. The far swirls of a galaxy on the edge, ed, 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 edge of the uh, solar system. And we're not meant to be found. Um, and, but yet the people who know that we're here are the ones who imprison us here. And those, uh, the, the Markabian, invader forces have something to do with that although to be honest i was never crystal clear on what they had to do with it like it's not like there's one book where l ron hubbard tries to chronologically explain exactly everything I, I like i truly as i say here today never actually understood what specific role the mark Habs and the invader forces played in bringing up about what things are now it was just sort of a general idea and that they'll be coming well, back one day and when they do it won't be good for us that's right that's right but i mean to, in all seriousness because a lot of people ask about this question um i was always told they don't come here you, like you don't really have to worry about it because again this is the dumping planet and there's five categories am i right about that of who's dumped here like artists criminals perverts Oh, sure. It was the, the troublemakers. 
He didn't right. say perverts. <laughs> it was supposed to it was supposed to make us like the rebels, the the disruptors, the people who wouldn't shut up. You know, the uh, the uh, the artists, the communicators, the, anyone capable of being effective was uh, dumped here. Oh, well, see, again, I was told differently in the Midwest. He said something different to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, could you imagine if he was like, you know, the rebels, the leaders, the artists and the perverts? But I really was told. <laughs> I really was told it was criminals, perverts. That's as you you're getting it confused with Australia. <laughs> I really was told that because I remember being afraid and thinking, I'm not in that category, right? I mean, I like to bone down, but with I like to bone down with consenting adults and you know, the normal kind of answering the bone phone. I don't wanna I don't wanna do anything perverted. I don't wanna be categorized as that. So I always thought, which one am I? Hopefully I'm an artist or something cool. <laughs> you weren't told that. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> huh, I Hell was. No. Oh, that's funny. Um, all right. Let's see. Dave Bowen off topic. But if the Hulkster storms the gates, call me. I'll take the beating with you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I did a whole video about Hulk Hogan today. I'm sure he's not happy. Uh, Case Ventura. How, how is the Thetan that has a body any different or better from the BT's? attempted to be discarded aren't those thetans from the same xenu source now these are the kind of questions people should be asking on ot3 so case the best i can figure is that the thetans who are capable enough aware enough alive enough to actually occupy a body came to earth after the volcano blowing up with the hydrogen bombs incident now you might go surely l ron hubbard explained the difference you would be wrong. L. Ron Hubbard never explains the difference. First of all, most Scientologists have never heard of Xenu and the body thetans. But right. once you read about Xenu and the body thetans, he doesn't actually explain how we other thetans came to Earth after all the body thetans were created. He never discusses it. And apparently you're not allowed to ask. But, um, but I'll tell you what. Mary Khan is someone you guys have all seen me interview on my channel a, a bunch or chat with her a bunch. She's going to be up and running pretty soon, being able to do live streams anytime she wants, just like, just like Reese, uh, Reese is doing and I'm doing, and I am going to be picking her brain nonstop about these OT level questions. In fact, Reese, we should do it together. We should have a, we should chat with, um, with Mary together and uh, ask these kinds of questions, but I've asked these questions before, which is how I know some of the answers. Like, L. Ron Hubbard, yeah, it would be so much fun. I really so loved fun. her. I think she's such a cool lady. Mary's the best. Mary's yeah. The best. Uh, thank you for the question again, Case Ventura. Clearwater Chad is in the hizzy with a super sticker. Thank you, Clearwater Chad. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gina, Aaron, any story at the Tampa Comic-Con Scientology booth visit? So, yeah, um, what happened there? So there were some Sea Org members manning um, a booth at Comic-Con for L. Ron Hubbard and his fiction works. And one of those Sea Org members is someone who um, uh, their family has not heard from them in over 10 years. And they asked me if I would go down and deliver a message. And so I did. And I said, uh, hey, I think you work with my wife in LA, da, 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 da. Um, and I said, you know, look, I'm just here because your parents asked me to come and um, give a message to you. Um, they really hope to be able to see you again. They hope to hear from you. And, uh, and if you need any help leaving, you know who to call. And then she goes, she goes, I, I know who you are. You're, you're Aaron. I said, yep, I'm Aaron. And, um, and then I said, look, I didn't want to make a scene or anything. I just wanted to give you the message. And, uh, and she said, thank you. I appreciate that. And she shook my hand. So message delivered, message wow. received. This is someone who I didn't know in the Sea Org. So for her to know who I am means she's just been warned about me, uh, which I guess is fair considering they were coming to Tampa, you know. It also means um, you're a celeb. Oh, don't try to hide it. Don't try oh, to hide it, Aaron. Quit it. All, all the Quit big it. bad SPs are celebrities to Sea Org members. I'll tell you that. Um, so thank you, Gina. Thank you. That's, that's, uh, thank you for the question. And that's what happened. 
Okay, Mama83. My mom, nurse, had heart surgery, got into a fight with the anesthesiologist because she refused to take one of the drugs. That's an old OT8 for you. Oh, wow. There you go. Um, Lori Plays says, sorry, Reese, I can only offer you Tampa Bay, but you are for sure a honey dipping sweet pea. Let's go to Bush Gardens, Disney and Hollywood Studios. How oh, my that? God. I would love to do that, you little frosted mini wheat. And I'm going to do it. I'm coming down there and we're going to get together. So many people. Like roll- I'm just going to start traveling. Everybody's invited me into their home again, hopefully for the right reasons. Nothing murdery. Hmm. <laughs> do you like roller coasters? I don't know if I still do. I have oh. not been on one for a while. Huxley loves them. I don't know. Okay. All right. Uh, Music Man says, Lori and Chad believe in reincarnation. She was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. She'll have two more lives to spend in jail. Okay. Something very interesting to consider. Um, Andy Fabulous says... <laughs> LRH wrote that the reason children had mental problems was because the parents had relations during pregnancy, which traumatized the fetus seeing this big Cyclops jabbing at it. I'm not kidding. Yes. That's pretty much what he said in Dianetics. That's true. That's right. That's right. (laughs) Uh, Joe Taylor. I'm glad no Thetan wanted my body. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Lulu, Lulu 92. When I drop my body, I'm coming back as a cat for Reese to rescue. So I can be pampered too. She is so pampered. I would give any of my animals a kidney if they needed it. Yeah. If only it was compatible. Um, well, I'm, okay. I, we can make it work. We have some LRH tech to do that. <laughs> Jennifer Strickland with all the UAP UFO talk going on. So you think, David Miscavige might think LRH might show up on his own ship. Yeah. LRH wouldn't need a ship though. That would be, that would be too low level. That's wog. That's wog. Think Jennifer. Yeah. That's wog Here's think. the thing. Uh, David Miscavige isn't worried about him coming back. Right. I mean, there's no paranoia there. He knows the truth that this dude's gone. It's not happening. Right. We're just selling a story. He's selling the story, but he knows that that's not real. Right. He seemed to believe it until like until it didn't happen. I think he thinks he's in the clear now. That's why okay. he's become okay. such a hor- a horrible person. He knows L. Ron Hubbard's not going to come back and people aren't going to be able to tattle on him. That's uh, probably true, actually. I bet because he died in, what, 86? Yeah. I think he probably was a little paranoid about that. But now it's been so long. You're right. I bet he doesn't care. Yep. He's got free reign. Do whatever he wants. Full on dick swinger. Exactly. Uh, Blowing in the wind. Joe Taylor, you and Reese are a great team. Yes, I think so as well. That's why we're trying to do as much together as we can. Thank you, Joe. Find our our groove. uh, Figure out what exactly we want to do with this. Mm -hmm. Uh, Case Ventura. Damn, Case. Case all over the place tonight. Um, better asked if OTs avoided hospitals, knowing the potential Thetans or BTs are there. Can a Thetan become a BT? But hold on case. There wouldn't be more BTs in a hospital than in the regular world. BTs are everywhere and they make up in one, in one place. Elwin Hubbard actually says that the BTs make up our body. Like there's some real crazy thing I've been told that I've never been able to make sense of that when you finish OT seven, one of the things that you attest to, I can't remember if it's OT three or seven, is your body being transparent because the BTs are all gone. I don't Go know ahead. how anyone makes. I I don't what know how anyone say? makes it. You, you'll hear us talk with when we talk with Mary about it. You'll hear her say that. But like, but case when we talk about thetans jumping over to the hospital to pick up a new body, those aren't body thetans. Those are regular thetans. Right. Right. Yeah. Body thetans can't animate bodies. Body thetans can only stick themselves to bodies. There's regular and there's diet. Those are diet thetans. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Joe Taylor says anyone who does understand LRH, wait, anyone's who does understand LRH, they are ready for a straight jacket. I get your point. I get your point. But Matt's right, caustic Joe. comments. Hey, hey, Ron, Reese is a fantastic addition to the SPTV family. Hashtag not just fishing for cutesy monikers in response at all. 
PTS, tell her about my parody videos. Thank you. Well, there you go, Matt. You just told her yourself. Um, I'll send you some. Person? Of the How cute. Uh, I'll send you some of the parody videos that he's done. They're really good. Adorable. Okay. I'm looking forward to that. Joni Cummings, if this is hell, then damn, we should be having a party. I want to think that if I want to think that if aliens, they would come to teach us. I don't know. This is the dumping planet. They're not coming here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> John Sostovsky. The bone phone was a wearable radio that draped around the user's neck like a scarf. Bill Haas invented the device and JSNA marketed it in 1979. So you really could answer the bone phone. Not in my house, John. That's not what it is in my house. That's not the same definition at all. Uh, not the same. Case Ventura says, gotcha. You're right. Don't try to make sense of it. It's funny because I do like trying to make sense of it. Um, but in, in the process of trying to make sense of it, you realize that people might confuse yeah. that I actually still believe in this stuff and I don't. I just like something to be internally coherent. You know what I'm saying? Um, here comes the dog. And dog, Ugh. dog, dog. Gertrude. <laughs> All right. Steven says, if you had one sentence or point you could make to any existing Scientology member to convince them to leave, what would it be? I know it's not that simple, but. Okay. Well, it isn't that simple, but, but if there were one point, it would be the fact that there are no upper OT levels. They don't exist. That's been the big lie ever since L. Ron Hubbard died that Miscavige has been perpetuating. And if you can get someone to believe that, that there's no such I thing did. as below T you. Yeah. I mean, I did too. I, I believed it too. You know, I mean, do you remember Were you No, you may not have been in anymore. I remember just a few years ago when uh, people, uh, my chiropractor and his sister and his wife were all OT. Are you not wanting to be up here? Um, and they went off to do their OT nine and 10 preps. Do you remember that? They went to the ship. I absolutely remember that because we had some OT eight friends of Heather's parents who would come and be like, we just got back from the ship doing our OT nine and 10 el preps and eligibility. And we're like, yep. you mean you, you mean you got a shit ton of sec checking? Like someone pissed on your leg and told you it was raining gold, gold nuggets. Ah, shit. My light went out. Take the helm. <laughs> Aaron. Gertrude did not want to be held. I don't know what's going on. She's upset about something. Big surprise. Over to Yuri's. Um, I believed it. You know, I think that was obviously a sales gimmick, right? Because that was to pump people up that it's real. They'll probably do that again in like another few years. It's probably every couple of years. Go do your nine and 10 preps. I remember that was a big deal. Yes. And that was like, I'm trying to think. Well, remember, I've already been out of Scientology for 10 years now. So these yeah. poor suckers, it was, so it was at least 12 or 13 years ago. These poor suckers were told, you need to come to the ship and get a shitload of sec checking so that your case is in shape for the release of OT9 and 10. That was 13 damn years ago. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. I believed it. I believed it. All righty. Let's see what's next. Um, Lathanda Grauklinga, one of my favorite, uh, my, one of my favorite handles on all You're of YouTube. You're good at that. Yeah. Uh, after such a short time of having her own channel, it seems Reese has been in SPTV forever. Erin, you did us a great favor by bringing Reese to us. <laughs> I love her. That's, That's so nice. Kind. That is so nice, Erin. Lathanda's awesome. Um, by the way, Reese has, uh, channel has already surpassed all eligibility for monetization. So we're just waiting for YouTube to get its back, back end together. And, uh, she'll be up and running just like, um, all the other good channels. So it's been, uh, it's been a really successful little experiment so far. And Reese is doing great with it. Thank you. And I'm excited. Good you job, guys Reese. actually watch. I've done some lives on my own. Aaron pushed me out and I started swimming out on my own. So I did it. And, uh, I can't believe people were actually listening to it. You know, Aaron, I was going to ask you about that. You know, as much of a guide as you've been, are there things I'm not supposed to say on YouTube? Because I've been talking about cooters and the bone phone. Don't even hop over to my channel. It's it's dirty time no, up there. 
Um, YouTube, after the first few minutes, YouTube doesn't really care what you say. And the truth is, if you don't care about your stuff being demonetized, you can say whatever the hell you want. It doesn't really matter. Um, they, uh, you'll, you'll get different opinions. So, so technically speaking, when YouTube demonetizes a video, that's not supposed to affect the reach of the video. At least YouTube claims that to be the truth. Any creator will tell you that they can tell that when their video gets demonetized, their video also gets suppressed. So when you hear people worrying about using the correct language and whatnot, it's not necessarily because of the monetization, but it's because YouTube will suppress the video if they deem it not to be family oh. friendly. So All right, guys, no is, more cooter and bone phone. Well, no, I mean, you haven't turned on monetization on your channel yet. You're still waiting. It, you can say whatever the hell you want. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, guys, tune in tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh okay. okay cc says robert harvey barry ross and i assigned treason for going to a lecture about ufo abduction at hollywood high school 83 4 by jack dearman at aola a week later he promoted me to staff maa <laughs> i've got to read this again Robert Harvey, Barry Ross, and I got assigned treason for going to a lecture about UFO abduction at Hollywood High School. I don't know what the 83 slash 4 means. Oh, in 1983, 1984, by Jack Derman at AOLA. A week later, he promoted me to staff MEA. That's, That's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah, sure for, a, for, for a cult that believes in UFOs and aliens, they sure don't want you talking about UFOs and aliens. Go figure. Uh, Jennifer Strickland says, I just wonder, since that 60 Minutes Australia, if David Miscavige is hopeful or worried about being found on Earth. I don't fully understand. No, I think there's a word there. Is there some word I didn't fully understand? Is there a symbol there that you don't recognize? Possibly. I think it's a misunderstood concept, really. Um, okay. Hugga Haggis with a little super sticker. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe Taylor, this prison planet is filled with beauty. If only LRH looked, if LRH only looked. Yeah, it's true. Um, Fujin, Fujin, Reese, I'm still worried about Scientology spy in front of your house who asked about your dog. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a second here. Stick with us, guys. Stick with us. Um, Al Alyssa, Alyssa1704. Aaron, look what you've done. I built SP TV so they would come. Close encounters of the SP. Reese, you are a Texas bright light little lone star. Come to Austin, Texas. I have so many animal rescues. We can cuddle. <laughs> I'm doing it tomorrow. I'm out of here. All you have to say is animals. That's what I mean. I would be murdered in a heartbeat. Someone would be like, I got these puppies over here. Animals, I'm doing it. It's I'm doing it for the animals. That's probably how that, I'm going to go. I'm going to get murdered. I can't come to Florida because I would feed the alligators. I would totally be like, let me feed them. Yeah, there's signs everywhere saying do not molest the alligators. I'm like, well, can you feed them? Yeah, I just want to feed them. I guess you had to be there. Uh, okay. Hug a hag is 66. If y'all call someone a wog in the UK, it's a crime often. Wow. What? Yeah, wog is a racial slur in the UK. No way. No, for real, it is. <laughs> and L. Ron Hubbard for sure knew that <laughs> from the Navy. It's also a Whoa. Navy. It's sort of a, a Navy. Um, there's one, I think one definition of wog is a sailor who has not yet crossed the equator. Um, there's a bunch of definitions, but there's no way L. Ron Hubbard, who spent a lot of time uh, you know, overseas, there's no way he did not know that was a racial slur in many countries on earth. There's no way he didn't know that. That's uh, terrible. Yeah. Lily Castle. I think the relatable Reese fans need to rally around their favorite pet name as the fan's name. I vote for little baby auto whiskers. That was a favorite, wasn't it? That was. It was. Also, I called your daughter a little baby glazed carrot. People really liked that. I got a lot of <laughs> private messages about that. Nice. <laughs> Uh, Carol, so just saying, says, I'm not sure the cooter and bone phone are on the radar. Uh, Reese and the uh, love Reese and the cooter talk. Yeah. You can speak in code on YouTube and they don't seem to care. Oh, okay. Well then we're safe. Aaron, don't watch my live from today. I won't. It's not, don't so. do it. A lot, a lot of cooter. A lot of cooter. <laughs> 
Yes. All we got to do is figure out now how to get your, uh, your camera thing resolved and you'll be, uh, you'll be totally squared away. I'll Stay get it resolved. Uh, yeah. Stacy, did you ever get the copy of the magazine that you needed? Yes, I did, Stacy. Absolutely. Um, okay. So Reese, let's talk about um, what's been happening with the private investigators in front of your house. Let's just tell everyone what's been going on. Um, so I've had a few in front of my house since we did our very first video. They come and I think I've told you guys we live in a cul-de-sac. So it's a little bit more obvious just because it's, you know, it's a cul-de-sac. So um, I've had a few. Jeff goes out and takes pictures of their license plates. I don't really mess with it. I don't go talk to them. I had one go into my backyard, but my backyard is not fenced and it goes on and on and on. Um like foresty. It's really pretty. So the guy went past the yard line. So it wasn't private property. As a matter of fact, it's, um, what does our HOA call it? Aaron, what's it, what would that be called? Um, um what the shared air, wait, which part? Yeah. 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 It's like common, um, common area, common property. Yeah. We kind of, yeah. Anyway, the point is it's not our property. Um, so that was one time, but otherwise I've not messed with anybody guys. That's the update on that until yesterday. I got a little bit shaken up. I mean, it wasn't anything serious, but it, it was more, I was telling Aaron, do you ever um, go into a, near somebody and you may not even have words, but you kind of get goosies, you get kind of uncomfortable, your hair stands up, you just get a feeling of, Ugh. Um, yesterday I always go outside with my phone and of course I didn't. And um, I took the dogs out front and there was a car right in front of my house. It was a black Volkswagen Passat, I believe, which is the, the four door sedan. Um, the windows were like black. You could not see through them. They were so tinted, but I got to see, um, through the windshield and it was a guy doing this as I walked out. And so he's just got his phone up and I immediately felt he was a little too close. The rest of them kind of park further down. So it's a little less obvious. Maybe, um, he was really close and he just had the phone up. I made eye contact with him and then I just looked away and I was like, go potty, go potty, go potty, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. I just want to get back inside. I was not comfortable. Um, so I'm getting him to go to the bathroom and the guy, his car was running and his headlights were on and he whips around in the cul-de-sac so that his car now he can roll the window down and see me. He's kind of our, we're facing each other and he rolls the window down. And I asked Aaron this, I assume it's because he was trying to then make it look like, Oh, I wasn't just filming you. And he stops car, he rolls the window down and he, he looks at me and he goes, Hey, is that a standard poodle? And I was just a little weirded out. And I said, uh-huh. And he goes, I got a buddy that has three of those. They're big dogs. He was like, that, that's a big dog. And I was like, yeah, I don't have anything else to say. And he just, he drove off. And so it wasn't like it was anything scary, but it was just enough that it was like, Ugh, it just felt really uncomfortable. And I don't know, Aaron, I feel like I was talking to my therapist about it today and he was like, I think you handled it right. Like, should I have been more aggressive and been like, what are you doing? I don't know. I just, I mean, sometimes like <clears throat> what I would do is not necessarily the same as what someone else should do, you know? Um, right. We, yeah. Like, but, uh, I would recommend get it. I would recommend have keeping your phone on you. I would recommend rolling video. I would recommend, um, but again, when I say recommend, I'm talking about what I would do, not necessarily what someone else should do, because it all depends on the circumstances. Um, but I, I would try to engage them in conversation. I would try to be like, uh, do you live around here? I would try to get them to say something, to trip up something, um, but also so that you have them on video so that you can call the police and just document every single time a stranger just happens to drive all the way down to the end of your cul-de-sac and stop and park and point cameras in your direction. Um, I don't think you want to ask. I don't think you want to escalate. I think you want to document um, and engaging them in conversation is not harmful. I mean, private investigators, especially the kind that have been hanging around my neighborhood, they've tried to chat up the neighbors um, because uh, I mean, hell, there's good private investigators, there's the bad private investigators. There's no one right way to be a PI, but just chatting them up in conversation is not going to hurt you in any way. And it might get them to say something stupid, 
you know. Um, okay. But it, it's just whatever you're comfortable with. Like, just don't do anything outside of your comfort zone, you know. I it, that's all good advice. I I did talk to my lawyers about it, and they just said they're there to just surveil. They're just watching. They're not going to do anything. But if you feel uncomfortable, of course, call the police and you know take photos if you need to. But that's really all the advice they gave me. But yeah, I don't know for whatever reason that particular guy just made me feel more like, whoa, I'm uncomfortable. I don't know. I just, um, yeah. I, yeah. You certainly don't only have to call the police when you feel uncomfortable. I think it is valuable to actually create some sort of understanding amongst the police now as to why you are so, uh, rightfully sensitive to strangers parking in your cul-de-sac. Like it's not a natural thing. And also no. private investigators, if they're legitimate, actually, this is important to know, actually. Um, when my neighbors started calling the police on the strange cars that were always parking in front of their houses at all hours of the day, the police would show up and make contact. And if they're a private investigator, they actually have to reveal that to the police officer. And proper decorum is for the private investigators to inform the local PD that they're on an assignment. They're going to be parked in this area if anybody calls so as not to waste the police's time. And so I think it's valuable to let the police know that, look, I'm going to be calling anytime a new strange vehicle posts up outside my house and puts cameras in my direction. I just want you to know I'm not just some crazy paranoid lady. There's a reason why we're doing this. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And hopefully you can find someone over there. Who and I told my next door neighbor, like, mm -hmm. just because I don't know my neighbors that well, but I told one of them and just said, you know, if you see anything weird, the great thing about my neighborhood, it's ev almost everyone's retired or like works from home. So I really love that. There's everybody's home. I also have cameras. Jeff has cameras out front and he also has cameras out back. Um, I saw a comment just a second ago that said you might make sure they don't have a camera on the trees. And I'll tell you, I think about that every time I go out back, I feel so uncomfortable. My, my house is so cool. It has these giant, like we have 18 foot ceilings when you walk in. So it's got these really tall, long picture windows that face the backyard because our backyard is like forest. It's beautiful. But I'll tell you what, I never close those windows, like close, like bring the shades down. And now I feel like I have to, cause I'm like, what if there are, you could see right into our house if you, you know? Yeah. Um, and whenever I go it, out there, I imagine that and I'm like, God, I hope I'm not like being recorded. And somebody else said like, you can put a microphone in a tree and it can have technology to hear you like from really far away, listen in on your conversation. I think so this is all stirred up. Sorry, go ahead. Are those trees in the common area? Yeah, it's nobody's property. But it would also, like, if some strange truck showed up with a an, a, an extension ladder trying to access those trees, is this the kind of HOA where, like, six people would call to complain? No. Oh, no one would question it. Interesting. Because so many of my neighbors, like my next-door neighbor who I told, gee, they've lived here, like, 22 years. They, I don't think they would question that. Um. I don't know. I, um, I think more Jeff said, he goes, and so it begins. I think now that I have a YouTube channel and I'm talking more, I wonder if it is going to stir up more action. Do you think so? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now what about Huxley? Because he's a minor, like I'm worried about that. They can't follow him, right? Like going to school. They can follow anyone. I mean, my, my kids have never been harassed that we're aware of. Um, my kids even sometimes will wind up with a, a friend that they did not know was a Scientologist. And I'm like, what do they know? And they're like, I don't know, dad, I've never brought it up and they haven't brought it up. I'm like, okay, well be careful. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like when, when we finally realized that some of these cars on our block had been PIs the whole time, you know, my middle daughter was like, oh, that car? we've been walking by that car like every day for months. I'm like, okay, well, well, next time you see, <laughs> next time yeah. you see cars with strangers idling on the side of the street, let us know. <laughs> yeah. Let us know. 
That's very Huxley. He won't, he doesn't pay attention to that stuff. So yeah. And he won't, but then, but then again, you know, I hadn't noticed any of it either. And, and meanwhile, it turns out the only reason my neighbors hadn't informed me months earlier is because they just assumed that of course I knew, right. They're like, of right. course, Aaron knows. <laughs> What if Aaron, what if there were cameras in those trees? How would I find out? You just have to, I, I, if those cameras are there, that means they're battery operated and batteries die and need to be replaced. So if you guys had some motion, I don't know if you put a motion camera up towards the canopy of trees, it's going to go off all the time. So that's not very useful, but, um, you know, in the case of Marty Rathbun, when Scientology succeeded in putting cameras in the trees around his house, they did that with the cooperation of Marty's neighbors. So if you can get your and of course, if one of your neighbors was secretly working for Scientology, of course, that's something they would lie to you about. So um, but the better relationship you have with your neighbors, the, uh, the better. And yeah. um, it, 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 just look, I mean, it'd be really, really hard, especially if you're home most of the time for them to get a truck and a, and a ladder. I mean, it, it sounded like they'd be tall, tall trees, right? I don't know. Um, they are. They, they, I mean, I there, did have no a, a crew. Yeah. There was some kind of a crew outside and they were, it was just weird. Again, being on a cul-de-sac, you notice everything. There's just not a lot of action going on. Um, and Jeff went out there and I was surprised. He's not very, I mean, he'll go out and like carefully take photos but he went out there these guys were like in hard hats and vests and they were like walking up and down the street and they had ladders and i was like what is hmm. this and why isn't it going on down the street it's just right here hmm. and jeff jeff went out and he was like who are you guys with like what wh what are you doing and they i mean i don't know they might have lied they told him like they were with the water department or something um but it's those kinds of things i don't want to be overly paranoid either but I, I can tell you yesterday that this guy doing this to me when I walked outside, I knew right away. And it just, again, it just made my hair stand up. I was really uncomfortable. Yeah. So, and, and especially with these programs that are, that are leaked where we can see exactly just how devious Scientology gets in trying to infiltrate people's lives and to set them up and to get friends to turn against them and to get their job. Like it, it, there's nothing wrong with being careful and being suspicious and, um, you know, not taking people's word for it. There's reasons, there's reasons to be careful and reasons to be, uh, to be vigilant and, yeah. and alert. So, and we have cameras, so that's good. Jeff has put cameras kind of all around the house. So, I mean, yeah. there's, that's all you can do. Um, and then the other thing, Aaron, before we end for the night, remember the other thing we were going to talk about that kind of pertains to that, the website. Yes. So the day after Reese and I did our first interview, someone bought uh, Reese Quibell or who is Reese Quibell? ReeseQuibell.com, March 12th. We did our interview March 11th. March 12th, someone brought ReeseQuibell.com. So we don't know for sure whether that was Scientology or someone buying it on your behalf to protect it from Scientology, do we? Yeah, no. And I don't know how you would know. So, so the reason I know this, we have the most amazing viewers, Aaron. I don't know if you know. I had somebody reach out to me privately and she bought whoisreesquabelle.com and she's transferring it to me. And then she said, um, what did Jeff say? Oh, Jeff, Jeff texted me and he goes, we also should buy relatablereese.com. And the lady went ahead and bought that too. I was like, you're amazing. People are amazing. They're just amazing. I don't know what else to say. So, uh, she got that too. She's going to transfer it to me, but she sent me the, the, a screenshot of, she goes, I went to buy reesequabelle.com as well. And she said, look, somebody bought it March 12th. So I can't, I said, Oh my God, our right. video came out March 11th or March 10th, something like that. So we may not know for sure that it was Scientology, but what we do know is that if it was someone who was doing it on your behalf, they have never contacted you to say, right. Hey, I got this for you. Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't feel like that. It feels like maybe it was Scientology. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. I let, um, uh, I, uh, back in the day, I went out and I bought who is Aaron Smith Levin because that's the URL Scientology would always use to attack people is the who is. Mm -hmm. And I was so stupid. I did not at that time take the opportunity to just buy AaronSmithLevin.com. Cause they had never done that to anybody before. So 
they have aaronsmithlevin.com and I've had who is aaronsmithlevin.com for so long that I let it lapse recently because I'm like, who cares? I mean, you could buy all the URLs and they're still going to come up with another one. Like it doesn't really matter. If they have Aaron Smith Levin, they might as well have who is Aaron Smith Levin. And one of these days I'll go through the trouble of suing them to get Aaron Smith Levin back. And then they can have who is, I don't care. <laughs> so do you have a website? I don't, I don't have a personal website. No. I mean, did they put one up about you? Oh yeah. Aaron Smith Levin.com is the hate website. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think yeah. I knew that. I think I knew that. I don't have one that I know yeah. of. I mean, I Googled it. I don't have one. No, it's definitely too early. They haven't created new hate pages for um, YouTube folks, but I think eventually they will. Just wait. Yeah. Just wait. Um, okay. Okay. Let's rattle through. I got, um, uh, let's rattle through some real quick here and then we'll, we'll call it a night. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Case Ventura, you cleared it up. Thank you. Grew up in a cult, but didn't get that far. Spat out my drink, by the way, with the uh oh lights, LMAO every time. Yes. Hang the on. Look at that. Hour... Sorry, Aaron. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Look at that. What does that the mean to you? Registered on Cloud Flare. I don't know what that means. Doesn't mean anything. To oh, me. okay. I thought you would know. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's all right. That's all right. Um, Michelle Carpenter just popping in to say the X word Xenu. By the way, I'm, I'm uploading an SPTV Discord walkthrough tutorial tonight for those who have asked on YouTube. Excellent, Michelle. That's a great idea. Thank you for that. Um, Matt's caustic comment says, speaking of correct language, who makes sure orders are translated correctly at foreign orgs, especially current ones? Anyone got busted for getting it wrong? That is an amazing question. I have never heard an answer to that question before um guys if anyone out there in scientology land which means like former scientology land knows the answer to this question um email me at growing up in scientology at gmail.com who makes sure that david miscavige's orders are translated correctly for the foreign orgs and has anyone got busted for getting it wrong that's a great question uh kim white says reese i listen i listened to your live earlier and i just wanted to ask you if you go out in the yard with your dogs um, I would hate for Scientology to have someone harm them, especially since that guy asked about your dog. Yeah. I'm all over that, Kim. I mean, so my mom has said that too. And the, the truth is, guys, I would lose my mind. You know animals and what they mean to me. Um, but how am I supposed to control that? My mom was like, make sure they are not eating anything. How am I supposed to make sure of that? My yard is huge there. And I, I don't know. I, I am a little bit nervous about it. Aaron, do you think that that's warranted it would be my mistake to tell someone not to be cautious about something like that uh the the records of scientology doing that to people are slim and few but not zero so you know i tend to be a little cavalier about these things but it would be a mistake for me to tell someone they shouldn't worry about it you know well, and especially as much importance as I put on my animals. I mean, my animals are a huge part of my channel even. Exactly. So if you wanted to get to me, I hate to exactly. say that on, on this, even saying it, but I mean, it's pretty, pretty clear. That's right. So it, it's something to, like you said, how can you, how can you keep that from happening? You really can't. Um, and it's like, it's kind of like if someone wants to get to you, they're going to get to you. That's how the world works. If someone wants to get to your animals, they're going to get to your animals. That's just kind of how the world works. Like we're not, you know, uh, we're, we're all accessible. Um, I hope it doesn't so, happen. That would ruin me. It would break my heart. Yeah. So, so I'm not going to tell you to not worry about it. Do I think it's actually a big risk? I don't personally, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything you can. Um, say, uh, I don't know, any safeguards you can come up with. You know what I'm right, saying? Right. Uh, Freezy new project. Reese, you could have said, how ironic. I have a friend that is a private investigator. <laughs> <laughs> I so should hook true. you up with my friend. Uh, she's a private investigator. You two would have a lot, a lot in common. I'm going to do that next time. Uh, Stephanie Stewart says, Gator almost Tate in canal with Trocrex. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate that. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> It's good two advice. Foot mama. Two foot mama. 
Someone should check the woods behind Reese's house for cameras. Yes. Bird watching Scientology edition. We're looking, <laughs> we're not looking for birds. We're looking for cameras. <laughs> uh, Case Ventura best stay away from our Reese. She's a frog's foot. That's awesome. <laughs> That's adorable. I like that one. That's cute. Joe, Joe Taylor accuse the PIs of filming children next time. Reese he'll leave. I did that when I was on workers comp. I had a PI follow me and park in my cul-de-sac. Wow. Hmm. Uh, Jane uh, Grider with a super sticker. Thank you. Uh, Lori plays says yes. Aaron, please across the bay can get in hot water. PIs. Wait, oh, PIs. PIs across the bay can get in hot water if they go on assignment without notifying the local agency that they will be on a job and where. Yep. Indeed. Hmm. Uh, jo Joni Cummings. Love how Scientology can't kill the goodness in people. It's true. So true. Uh, Janine Greider says, listen to your intuition. Yes, I agree. Totally. Uh, Destiny Salazar says, Osa needs all the deets on you, Reese. I'm not going to read that. Sorry. <laughs> Why? Aaron? You read it. You read it. We uh, go over to, uh, we had a cooter talk for a good hour today. Aaron, it's refreshing. You should try to sometime. It's important. Yeah. Keep well, up on the go. cooter. Thank you, Destiny. Don't be silly. <laughs> Maria de Jesus Gutierrez says, I'm the nice lady. <laughs> she is the nice lady. She's the one who got me the websites. She bought the URLs. Oh, Maria. So she really is the nice it. lady. I love her. I actually, yes. I actually met Maria in real life at the Danny Masters in trial. So she is really she is the, the nice lady for sure. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Maria says Cloudflare seems to be a big crawler buying random sites. I bought her the other sites. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Amber Glass says, Reese, you can plan for the worst and have pet first aid meds and vet info ready. Yeah, that's that's smart. Hundred percent Amber's. Cat ACDC fan says Reese is an awesome addition, different perspectives for different folks. I love her seriousness with her animals. <laughs> That's so sweet. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, before I forget, guys, please, you can jump over and subscribe to YouTube on her own channel at Relatable Reese at Relatable Reese. And like she said, she's been doing her own lives. She's been, uh, you know, uh, stretching those YouTube muscles, getting it all figured out. And um, yeah, we're going to be doing so so much more so um and aaron's gonna help teach me how to like clean up my channel like intros outros i don't know what any of that means but uh we're gonna get the camera fixed so guys stick with me stay stay in there we'll we'll get it done right aaron you're gonna help me with that right hell yeah hell yeah mm. all right everyone thank you so much for watching we've had a blast this evening thanks for probably see you tomorrow until the very end and we will see you tomorrow have a great evening Talk to you guys soon. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see a, a different one of my videos, uh, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe.